just me saying he's great, but he really is. He's a funny dude, charismatic, a little full of shit, but in the best possible way, right? And uh, I miss him, man. So how you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. I'm sorry to hear this is a late start for you. You actually interrupted my sleep, but oh, uh, oh, oh, oh it, darn! I, I somehow somehow I feel, <laughs> feel it's, okay. it's, it's eleven o'clock. Yeah, I, mean, I know. That's, yeah, but uh, no, I'm doing I'm doing great, Josh. It's really good. It's been way too long. Glad yeah. to be on. Yeah, new format. Good. I've checked out your uh, I've checked out your previous ones. I'm loving the new format. Yeah. So do you, you let off with you let off with Susie Bedori, I think, right? Was she your first? No, in I let off with Jennifer Gordon. I've had Susie's on. That's so right. Far. Jennifer yeah. Gordon. Um, so here's my guest tomorrow, Mark Park, who worked on Game of Thrones. As an awesome. Story on, all right. Elsa Garrett Garza is an art director of Warner Brothers. I'm drawing Alice in Wonderland stuff with her next weekend. I've been so I I've. This has been crazy. I'm already booked into the second week of February for guests. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I'm already booked. Like, this is crazy. Like, and it, and the first month took three days. But, like, yeah. the first month took three days. The second month took was faster when I actually started. Okay, what, 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 what days are good? It's funny because um, uh, Creative Edge had to pull a guest out, and they're like, well, when are you free again? It's like – March. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I, I mean – you're loaded with powerhouses in the first quarter of your cast. I'm glad you were able to slide a lightweight in today so you can kind of take it easy a little bit. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, man, I, uh, it's been crazy. Like, just from my end, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm almost at 20. Like, for Twitch, it's 50 followers to become an affiliate. I'm at 17 already. Um, I broke 100 followers on my YouTube channel, which I started a month ago. I was at 64 just just because I was just storing my old podcast, I wasn't trying to promote it. So I'm treating this like like um, I'm treating this like how a streaming gamer um, yep. does this because that's the best business model for this this model is. And to be perfectly honest with you, I actually think I, I, from a writing standpoint, some of us do need to play more video games because it's a very it's a very cool story format. That no one really like from a classical side of things knows what the hell they're doing then. And it's right. So, right? And I and I yeah. and the future's gonna be I think mediums become more and more merged as time goes on. And so I think we're all gonna have to get, on some level be good at playing games, whatever those games are. So cause that that because interaction is a big part of storytelling too. You know what? I I would say that applies to more than just authorship or yeah. any type of creative uh, endeavor. I think what we're learning is that um, game participation and engagement, especially non-zero sum games, that's the future of the fucking world. I mean, that that's how societies are going to make it. That's how yeah. we're going to figure out the challenges that faces that 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 you know, rising tides lift all ships, and we got to fucking pull together and, and learn from that sort of. The, I'm thinking about especially, you know, your interactive uh, role play, massively multiplayer role playing games where there are things that have to be done collaboratively. You, you mm -hmm. can't achieve otherwise. And that's real life. I oh, mean, yeah. we're, we're deep in it. And it resonates, I know, with people younger than me on a deeper level. I've, I've had to learn it. But those of y'all who are video game products, it's like you, you get it. You're seeing yeah. it already. Oh, yeah. Like, um, yeah, I, I'm just young enough. That I was just caught into the, the, the Nintendo craze. I'm just old enough to remember when it wasn't that it wasn't so prevalent. So it was like I'm 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 in that beautiful middle of my generation. I think in one sense is very lucky. We've had the ability to see everything change. That's the bad part is we don't have a solid place to land. But on yep. the but on the good but the good part is we can we can still be kind of anything for anyone because it's the change is like as we become more digital, as we become more, like, we can do that. We can still go back to something a little bit more low tech at this point, yeah. right? And everybody that followed us, although I will never, there, there are six year olds that can kick my ass in video games, and I have made my peace with that. I just, I've told them, <laughs> right? I mean, right? Yeah, yeah, I made my peace with that. Like, there are some Call of Duty masters, and they're like, and they're like barely in like grade two, and they're kicking, and they're kicking everybody's butt, and you're like, dang and um but at the same token it's just i i'm still like my generation is still in that era where we can go analog digital it doesn't matter we can we can yeah. do stuff yeah. and i think i think that's a it's a it's a really cool thing that you can take like almost the shape of water you guys 
you're old enough, you, you're still young enough to change, but it's a little tougher because it was a, just a different, it was a different um, environment for you guys all together. What I'm finding is is difficult uh, in in the realm of change. I mean, I'm a, it, we've talked about this. I'm not af afraid of self reflection. I'm not afraid of uh, admitting I'm wrong. I'm not, you know, yeah. I, I'm, and I welcome growth opportunity. It's that it's harder for me to spot it anymore. It's not mm -hmm. that I'm I'm not closed down to it. It's that I don't even see it. So you know, I, I've I found myself engaging in discussion and, and some you know some pretty relevant themes, but with uh, younger colleagues and 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 social activists and you know a whole sea of people that I mean I am still using outmoded terminology and and I'm I'm still thinking in in models of change that were relevant two decades ago, but now I mean they're already passed. Uh, my daughter's 31, and and you mentioned not really having anywhere to land. I mean she. She can understand me and mm -hmm. relate to me, but she can also understand 15 and 16 year olds. And I can't. Yeah. You know, I, well, yeah. But, but, well, I'll give you, I'll give you a cool, would you like a comfort? You want to, you want a really cool yes, comfort? Yes, please. Yeah, please. It, actually, at this point, any comfort would do. Yeah, that's good. You're probably, you're probably, see, I, I, re I recognize this because I'm, I'm, right now I'm in Windsor, Ontario. I'm house sitting basically for my dad. This is a house he, he, he's watching and I'm watching for him. In the meantime, it's letting me try all these different things out. But when I talk to my dad, my dad is older than you are. Very smart. He's still a very smart man, but his ideas and thinking are older, right? And and they're just they're just different. They worked for him, and it made me rec recognize something. Is I I mean I'm now middle aged, and eventually I'm going to get old. I'm going to get old one day, and I'm gonna, and I recognize the fact that for me, um, there's going to come a point in my life where I look at the flaws I'm trying to grow now, and I'm going to yeah. I'm going to accept them. Those are right. my flaws. Those are who I am, and and that to me, and to me at least, anyway, um, I think that's a good. I think the key is when you uh, maybe you, you you can speak on this more than I can at this point. I think the key is it's recognizing where you can that you can still learn, right? And sure. that and that and that even though you're there are some things you probably will never change at this point, and that's fine. But there are yeah. some things where you're like. And that's fine. I think I think we all need to need to embrace the flaws, even in writing. That, that's a big thing I find. Like, well, I'm not trying to be perfect anymore. I try just to accept my flaws and accentuate my strengths. And I think maybe, yeah. what, and maybe yeah. I think maybe I think as I get older, and that's I'm maybe, and I, I've kept in the back of my mind, there will come a point where change for me is going to get more difficult. And when it gets to that point, um, be smart enough to accentuate my strengths. Be smart enough to recognize that I have flaws. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And uh, it, yeah, it's knowing yourself, right? And uh, yeah. I mean, let, let's let's grow in the direction of change that is the most feasible. Recognizing that you know some of our less flexible parts are are just their weaknesses to be governed. You know, they're not going to change. Now, yeah. Not in every case. Let me ask you though. I mean, does your future uh, model of change include a haircut? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I was like, yeah, I, I, you are to haircuts as I am to shaves. I'm gonna yeah. have to do something well, about this. Well, I, I, I may have promised myself so this. This is this is the awkward thing. Like, I didn't. So when I started doing freelancing this time, it right. I I so the big cool thing, and you know this, is finding your niche. It didn't occur to me till about six months into this that I had a niche already. Like it's one of those like no, oh! right? Yeah. Hence the, hence the change. Hence the change into what this format is. Um. But on the flip side, so I may have promised myself like while the pandemic was going, see it like grow the hair out, right? So now I'm in this really awkward spot that I'm like, okay, I'm literally gonna try to get a haircut Saturday because I don't know how much longer there is before they lock down here again. Right. Um, and so I'm, I'm gonna try to get it Saturday. If I can't for whatever reason, I might be stuck with this till January. Yeah, like, well, you, you know, that's the thing is, yeah. You know, it it is funny. You're right. You, you know, you're thinking. Well, I need to reinvent myself so that I can fit a niche. Well, you already do, right? I mean, yeah, every one yeah. of us, every one of us is already what we are. You know, and then, but, yeah, sure. I mean, if you want to redefine and if you want to reshape and add a style or look or fashion or whatever, I've I've done this three or four times now in the past eight months, and eventually I have to get rid of it again because, you know, I, say what you want. I know it's natural. It's not nice. It's not, it's not you. It's okay, man. No. 
No, of okay. course it's not. I, I, I mean, I mean, I can make some Santa Claus jokes right now, and I, I, I'm being very good not to do it, you know. Because I, I appreciate I, that. I look like 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 a a, a, a gray headed man with his head on upside down. I'm like, <laughs> just, <laughs> just, just grow out a little, no, just grow out a little bit more. You put on the hat and you just bring a list, and you be like, you know, yeah. Yeah, 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 you can, you can do it. You can do it. I, I think that's it. popular, by the way. With this, that I, I don't know how adult we want to be here. I was disturbed to learn this. There is such a thing, actually, as the the Billy Bob Thornton Santa fetish girls. There, there are. There, really? there. I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, oh, they're chicks into Santa. Yeah, you learn this when you. I don't know how many uh, uh, folks in 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 Canada know this. Um, all of America has by now gotten the memo. I know that kind of shit. If you want to know some perverse fetish level stuff, ask him. I've, I've researched it. Yeah, they're, okay. No, that's cool. I, 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 I've been exposed to doing these interviews. I've been exposed to a lot more of this stuff, too. I, I, uh, I'm amazed. Actually, the biggest thing I'm amazed at one of the people when I interview, like when I interview people, is how much they share with me. It's like, yeah. whoa, I, didn't, I did not see us going this way at We all. talked about that in Calgary, and I've, yeah. talk, uh, I've shared that with you uh, on social media recently. Uh, you know, what is it about Josh? And I, was, I, I, I can't put my finger on it, but... Um, once you start talking to him, you're going to tell him your life story. I mean, it, 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 in fact, this is like a month's worth of counseling for me just doing the show. So. <laughs> you're not the first person to say that either. I interviewed, I interviewed uh, before I turned this to the audio, um, uh, Morgan Chammy. She was like, at the end of that, like, I, I felt like I visited my shrink. It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, it was great. She goes, it was great. Thank you. It's like, oh, oh no, no problem. Now, if, if this doesn't work out quite the way I, I envision it working out, like by the time March, April rolls around, I'm like, okay, I still haven't quite gotten to the point where I'm making, thinking what I'm making. Like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna, probably going to be broadcasting in psychology as a school thing, like going back yeah. to school and actually, get, because I already broadcast. I'm, that will, the broadcasting would annoy me to some extent, not because I don't, I'm, I'm not opposed to learning, but I, at that point, I'm going to have like 500 episodes of this under my belt. Right. Yeah. Right. It's, hard. Like, it's like this is more for the piece of paper than for me. I mean, I'm not saying that I won't, there's stuff I won't learn, but again, I'm not. I'm open to that. But it's like I don't really need that. No, it's like, I don't really need like psychology, formal stuff. Some of it's great. I'm sure some of that I'm going to say the same thing. I don't really need this. But broadcasting is the one I look at and go, why did I have to get this? But I, I mean, yeah, I, no, the first two years is going to drive me nuts. You know, why, yeah. why am I listening? Yeah, I, I know how to do that. I can go put on a show. You know, yeah. But yeah, I'm sure there is some, like you say, I mean, I'm sure there's all sorts of things that. Yeah. That train. Well, it, for instance, I, I have bemoaned the fact many a time that um, I did not formally study literature or any kind of, of creative art. I, if, if I had it to do over again, I might have um, because that's where I ended up. I write for a living. Mm -hmm. Um then I do it without any training. And so I, I think, you know, I'm 55. So I think I've got the shit. And then, but I'll hear, you know, lit majors talking about things that I don't even know what that means. <laughs> and, and I think, oh, well, so, okay, humble me. I'll just go sit in the corner. and, and uh, We got joined by a guest, Nate Baygate. What are we talking about? Right now we're talking about university education and we're we're grumpy old men about it because of going back knowing shit we already do and, and getting a piece of paper for it is what is what annoys us but at the same token like i, I i'll say something i'll say a compliment to tony at the same time i the thing i admire about what you did though is you, you ended up doing what you really love to do without asking permission for it yeah I think well, I, I, yeah I you're, think you're right it, and it, it involved in some ways you can talk about you know creating a niche i i I happen to be very good at something so detailed and tiny and microscopic in the field of doing things that there aren't that many people who do it. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's what I do. And uh, sometimes it's, it's tossing word salad in government contracts that drives me just absolutely fucking batty. But even that is writing. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I write every day and I get to do it for a living. So I'm pretty lucky. Yeah. Well, like, like I said, I think going forward into the future, too, is this is asking the last true frontier for big money is actually our industry. Because sure. now, because now intellectual property is worth 
is worth a lot more than it ever was. Especially right this minute, I've said I've released two books this year. I'm trying to release a third before it's all said and done. I, I, I've, I've gone all in this year, man. I just said that was, that's the awesome. whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what I realized is it's not that the, just the books I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about the video games. I'm thinking about the t-shirts. I'm thinking, I realize it's from a business standpoint. It's not the first sale I necessarily care about. It's all the different places I can sell. Right. Because, Oh my right. god! And then that's the biz, That's the, that's the real business of what we do. Um, well, you know something? We've all got a, a hands-on learning experience because of this fucking apocalypse, right? I, yeah. You know, I, there were one of the the most important lessons I think come from this on a a, a mag, you know a macro level is that there's a lot of shit that we should have been doing remotely to begin. You know, mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who never should have been commuting 45 minutes to sit in a, in a cubicle when they can oh, do their work okay. more effectively, more efficiently, and less pissed off at home. You know, there, 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 and there, there's all sorts of commerce that can be done remotely that doesn't require the bricks and the mortar and the shit and everything, and the planet's better off for it. I, I, I think so. The the two things I really like about what has happened here um, is, yeah, I think I think the idea of going to work in an office job. Like, yeah, it's, it's always the silliest idea. Like looking looking at it in hindsight, especially since we're in the digital age, it's the dumbest idea ever. It literally right. is the dumbest idea ever. At most, I should be going to the office if I'm a, if I'm a office worker. At most, I should be going to the office either once a week or once a month. One, yeah, two, maybe three, some team building shit, and that's about yeah, it. Other than yeah, that, you don't yeah, need. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's it, right? You're like some team building shit, but also every once in a while, just check in. It's good to have a relationship with your boss. It, it actually kind of is. It is, and this is you know this is testing um, kind of some of the fundamentals of, of humans that you know. I, it's also something I will take from it is that it's okay to be alone. You know, I, it, it's not um, a, a death sentence for me to isolate. You know, and it's hard for me. As you know, I'm, I mean, I, I kind of feed off of social interaction. I like people and I, I, I like to be out among people. Um, and so it's affected me in that regard. But it's been an important learning lesson that, you know, I'm not gonna, it, it's not going to kill you to spend a night by yourself. No, it's, not. no. <laughs> it, it's OK. I learned I learned this like like um, I started dating a little bit later on in my life. And I really love what it feels like to be with someone. But one of the things, that, but one of the things I, I'm also at least with is if I never do end up with someone, right? Uh, I, I, so I, I again, this is uh, this is my family has a history of very very bad relationships ending really poorly. Like the way my, like almost every one of my family members has been divorced. So um, it took a long time for me to to let unlearn some shit. Um, but what what I what I realized though is one of the things I did get the one positive I got being when going through what I went through is eventually I made peace with the whole concept like if I do end up with somebody great I hope that works out I find somebody wonderful I go go crazy and see the world with as time goes on because I realize that in this time it's really about what you love to do and who you and who who you love to do it with there's really not much else to this life yeah. and um. On the flip side, on the flip side, um, if it doesn't work out where I find someone, I can still find happiness. I can still be fulfilled and still live a really good life, right? Just with the people I do interact with anyway. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, and I mean, that's to your credit. Right? That's it's still something that I know abstractly, but, but have a difficult time internalizing. I, you know, I, I think that there are performers in all of us but some of us who are you know particularly extroverted I, i'm it's fuck second person plural, my first plural first singular me something about me is that i know that i tend to project a lot of myself out into the world looking for positive feedback and if i don't get it it's crushing so it's like i'm only externally validating and you know the the, the work itself whatever it is doesn't really do all of me. i know people who are intrinsically rewarded by the completion of, of a good deed or a good work or you know whatever they're that whatever does fulfill them it's all internal mm -hmm. and um my and my ex-wife and i used to, to debate about this as a matter of fact because we ran together um she's a far more accomplished runner than i am 
but I, I ran with her in several 5Ks and some other little things. And uh, she would say, well, isn't it just exhilarating? Don't you just love it? And I was like, no, I fucking hate it. I mean, I hate every step I take. It's like, there's nothing less fun than running, Josh. This is, this is what you do. It's like you're a runner. You just start out at a slightly uncomfortable pace. And the more uncomfortable it gets, the longer you keep doing the shit. So it's just fucking terrible, right? I hate everything about it. And she's like, well, well, why do you do it? And as you know, well, it's because I have one leg. And so I'm running on a prosthetic leg. And, and, and I said, I do it for the fucking applause, Karen. I think that would be obvious, right? I mean, the moment people stop encouraging and cheering, I'm going to stop fucking doing it because I don't well, like it. Well, well, I mean, I mean, there might be, I, it, it's not always necessarily just the applause. It's who's the, who's, who's giving it to you to? True. Right. That, that's true. Right. That's true. I, I, honestly, one of the most motivating things for any guy on the planet is to impress a chick. That is one of the most, like, it's, one, yeah. Yeah, it's one of the most simplest things, but honest to God, it works with me. It's still, I mean, I've all these views, it, it works. It works. If I'm with somebody I really want to impress, you know, I'm going to lift that nine times. I don't want to lift that right. nine times, but I'll do it, right? And so when I when I finally convinced Karen I'm not going to run with her anymore, I, I, I switched and took up powerlifting that I that I was active in for about three years. And here's the disappointing thing: women don't really give a fuck how much you can bench press. Yeah, now you think you want them to come watch you do this shit, right? But yeah. and and and. Uh, no, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean fuck but, all because here, here's the, it no, mean, no, they don't care. No, no, because, and in all fairness, them in one sense, right? I don't give a shit how much you can lift, right? I right. care. What you, I, I care what you're gonna do when the shit hits the fan. That's what I care no. about, right? Absolutely, right. but I think we, we have it in our mind somehow. That, you know, we're gonna flex just right, and she's gonna notice the way that the pecs line up, and then she's gonna go, "Wow, that's a lot of weight." But no, she doesn't give a shit. No, no they're, they're, not. They no. don't care. No, I, I actually think they secretly enjoy it sometimes because they know they they, they have that cra that they have that crazy power over us. All right. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, I, I think the women like like men like to feel nurtured and, and protected okay. and cared for, and, and and you know, and I I don't mean that in a patriarchal way. I, I think that's just part of healthy relationships and couple them. I think most people want that. They they want the sense of safety and security and comfort, but it, it does not come from you looking like the young Arnold and being able to lift the back of a bus, you know, nobody, no. nobody gives a shit about that. No. Which no, is disappointing. It only was that simple, but it, it's not. I mean, every, everybody's a little different. What I, what, um, what I, what I have found, what I found ultimately what works, what works best for me anyways, is paying attention and listening. I mean, oh, that, yeah. that's it. That's actually. It's yeah. But you know what? Now, that's a cul-de-sac down which you can find yourself led and trapped. Because, you see, I'll start off in the courtship days being enormously patient, listening closely, reflectively listening, actively listening, asking and following up and how was your day. And it, it, it went, it really, I don't really care about that. And so now, you see, I've set the table so that when I start to fail as a boyfriend, it's because I can't keep up the bullshit standard that I set for myself. No, 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 listen to no. I don't give a fuck about your call with your sister Melissa. Just absolutely don't care. <laughs> so, so this this is a rule I've made for myself. This is a rule because again, I this is what I, I interview people for. Living you're you're going to you say I, something I, I, about I, I, being. You're going to say something about being authentic or genuine or some shit, and then yeah, I'm going to feel right, damn right, damn right, right. Or because yeah. because that that because you can't. You don't have to remember your bullshit standards if you don't have any. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah. right. You don't have to. See, I, I love being honest for that reason, right? I love being a straight shooter for that reason because I don't have to, I don't have to remember any of this bullshit. All I have to do is you know, <coughs> be myself. Now, you still screw up sometimes because that's just life. But you know, but, hey, hey, but, you know, now Cosby said something about this. Um, this was before we knew that Cosby raped all those people. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, anyway, Cos, Cosby said, he says, you know, they tell you, you know, just be yourself. And I'm like, but what if you're an asshole? You know, <laughs> that's not but, 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 well, keeping a, keeping a relationship, that might be difficult. You are an asshole, but getting right. one isn't hard. No, because right? I've seen plenty of assholes in relationships. Yeah, 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 no, getting one isn't hard. Keeping, keeping is another story, but getting, but getting one, no, that's not hard. I, I, um, 
I, I, I had a guy give me advice, an old friend of mine, a former friend of mine, gave me this advice, and it was weird, but I thought he was, I, I thought he was crazy, but inside, and sometimes I think he's right. Treat a woman like a whore, <laughs> treat a whore like a, like a queen, right? Right? Yeah, and, boy, and, and, I, and, and, oh, man, you got 50% of your following, gonna kick your ass well, out. No, but, <laughs> but, but, but the idea was, but, but, but the idea was, because he was such an asshole, he, and he did, he was, he was getting, oh, women, yeah. giving his phone number, he was getting women to, it wasn't, it, there was something about it because there was, I think older women don't fall for that shit no more. They're like, oh, fuck you. Yeah, I've that's right. I've ever been through this ringer. But younger women think, oh my God, he's so confident, even though he's got literally nothing to him. Right. 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 But it, it comes yeah. across standoffish. I'm kind of my own person. I'm, I'm confident. And if he's got some flaws, I can fix that. Yeah. Right? I, I, as, as a general rule, I can say this from experience. Um, the older you get as a man, the less you have to be a, 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 mm -hmm. a show off or any of that kind. I oh, mean, yeah. the more you know, you, things that mattered in high school in terms of mate selection, they don't fucking matter when you're 50. I mean, no, no, no it, it, because it is all about how well do you listen? Do you make me laugh? Are, you know, are, are you fun to be with after we had sex? You know, yeah, yeah. Do, do we have the, the, the same core values, that these things in place? And you know, I mean, there's still, am I attracted to you? Um, if I, that, 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 but, that never yeah, no, it's, it's, it's far easier the, the older we get, I, it, which is ironic because I think it's harder for women. I, I think that we've set up this ridiculous, you know, you're mm -hmm. no longer pretty past 25 bullshit. <laughs> I, and the thing is, I, okay, so I'm, I'm at this weird age where 25 is still pretty, but 50 yeah. is also pretty. Right, yep. right. Yep. I'm, at, I'm at that age where if, if I see anything along, the, I was like, I'm game, and good, bad, or indifferent. Like that, that's just the way I see it, right? But, I, I, I hear you. Yeah, I, I saw Jane Fonda the other day. She's 80 years old, and I thought, God, I'd hit that. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? I, 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 well, listen, I, I'm just there. I have, uh, I, I've had, I've like, I've seen like some some women are. Actually, a lot of women become even prettier because they get Absolutely. more defined. They get more defined as they get older, Absolutely. and, and you, you can see literally their story on the face. And it's an amazing. It's actually an amazing process, right? Yeah. Now, it's all. It all comes down to how well the woman took care of herself in her twenties, too, because sometimes, sometimes depending on what you do, and it's true, guys as well. What you oh do, yeah. You want, what you, if I if I knew I was going to live this long, I'd have taken much better care. Of so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but see, that's why that's why we're young first. We can be stupid. Hey, let me back up a second. So, hey, so you know the 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 uh, uh, principle of conversation that um, suggests that if any two people talk long enough, eventually one of them will invoke Hitler. I'm what? Do you think Cosby is going to be like that in the future? It's, you know, if you talk long enough, eventually Bill Cosby comes up, or or Harvey or or, or Harvey Weinstein or something. I mean, well, I, I see. It. The entertainment industry has so many, how do I put this? Not so delicately, but just accurately. Rapists? Rapists, criminals, <laughs> um, It's hard to choose just one, right? Yeah. And, um, so I don't know. So but the topic though of, of, of the, 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 the you too, uh, or the me too movement, uh, that topically is going to be whatever is it. If you talk long enough, eventually you got to get around it because mm -hmm. powerful men need to stop raping women. Right. They, they just mm -hmm. do. And, and I, a dude said to me about Cosby, he's like, you know, the worst thing about Cosby is the hypocrisy. I was like, eh, I don't think that's the worst thing. No, I think probably the raping was the worst thing <laughs> than the drugging and then maybe the hypocrisy is like third or fourth but yeah, you know powerful men just need to stop raping people. I, I, I the hypocrisy here, here, here's the united states's problem i i we're, we're, we're this is i'm gonna dip into politics i love when I, I love when you do this you yeah, tell me what's, what's you wrong with actually, the attorney what point this out if somebody else pointed this out to me and i thought he was actually right you guys have a fucking grandpa problem right Ooh. <laughs> you have a grandpa problem. You have the senile old grandpas running your show, and they had this old way of doing things that's never quite you've never quite outgrown. The problem is, here's here's the depressing thing. I look at Biden, I look at Trump. They are more similar than they're different, right? And that's that's horrifying. 
right? But the thing is, on the flip side, okay, Herbert George Bush was a grandpa. Ronald Reagan was a grandpa. Nixon was a grandpa. Uh, Clinton and Obama were the only two that weren't exactly grandpas, but they were approaching grandpa when they got in yeah. there. So, so you, you've had this certain voice, certain way for so long. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think what's hap what happens is uh, this is I think this is, I think this is yes the raping and the drugging in that order is a big problem. But so is the fact that you've got this grandpa mentality that's existed since um since like the shit sixties at least. Yeah. I, I, I think, yeah. 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 At least sixties at least. Uh, and it hasn't gone away. And, and as far as women, as far as women like in fiction goes, I didn't realize this actually, and it's actually a bit heartbreaking for me. Asanoff is one of my favorite authors. I I found out just how much he, he might have been a big reason why there was far less women in science fiction. Mm. His behavior towards women mm. back in the sixties, seventies, and eighties. There are literally pictures of him. Going to kiss women, and women are like, like, like they're they're trying to avoid. Yeah, I you know I knew those men because I I was growing up in the late seventies and then yeah. a teenager in the eighties, and um, uh, I, I I remember going to work with my dad. My dad worked; he was an executive in the National Football League, so I I grew up around oh, yeah. uh, football players and retired football players and ex jocks who still thought their shit didn't stink, and they could literally just slap a waitress on the ass. I mean, my dad was uh, always uh, fairly respectful and genteel. Um, I think because he was raised by a Southern mother to be so, but yeah. if, in general, I mean, just the comments toward and the expectations of women were still, they were pretty mad men, right? I, it was, uh, yeah. And, and it's, you know, I, I, in my thirties had to think myself out of that mindset because, you know, you don't think a lot when you're 20, you know, then by the time you are 30, you realize, oh, I've made kind of a shit state of affairs for myself here because of my own paradigm. So and that plus I had a I had a daughter and um, mm -hmm. had to start rethinking, you know, what's OK? Because I don't want a, a man to be able to crowd up behind my daughter and make an excuse to, to brush against her at a bar. And, you know, you know all, all the shit that we all did that that makes me think, you know, we don't just need the Me Too movement. We need the I also movement, you know, because all that women are asking for is men as allies to say, you're right. We've always done that shit and we need to quit fucking doing it. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean you're the BTK killer. What I mean is if you've ever whined, cajoled, tried to get a woman drunk, you know, done any of the shit, rubbed up against her, sat too close on a fucking bus, brushed your hand on the foot, then you're guilty. Oh, yeah. You know, and that's the kind of victimization that women have been dealing with for uh, you know, well recorded history, and, and there are these little microaggression things. We'll quit doing them. Yeah, like, oh, well, okay. So even today, like, you're talking about athletes. Okay, football players put any. I'm not excusing this. I'm just saying, like, I, I even today, this is still football players, MMA fighters. You're right. They're wild motherfuckers. Right. They're wild. Yes, they, are. Wild, they are wild people. They are, yes, they are. And, and they have to be because they're job description requires that because their opponent is trying to literally figuratively kill them right all right yeah no that's that's what you face with combat soldiers coming back from overseas is i mean you expect this dude in 24 hours to turn around from an outpost in afghanistan and function yeah. in manhattan it's not this you can't you know i mean these then like you say these are pumped up testosterone driven crazed violent men who get paid to do that whether yeah. you know football players yeah, mma fighters that yeah, and you're, a pro and you're a product of your in of your environment and in your environment. It's one of those things where it's like, yeah, they they would great. I mean, that's a for me. I like I get I get that. I also, but I I think the environment to create to create the environment where they can tone down also needs to be there because you just like you just said you just can't turn the switch See, off. That that's one of the wise things that they've done in sports. I in my opinion, in the NFL, yeah. it, it um. When I was young, the reporters immediately following the game are talking to a player in his locker. He's sitting there naked and, and sweat still dripping down. He hasn't even decompressed from being on the field yet. And questions are flying, and it's an all-male environment. And um, women had to be excluded from that for you know whatever cultural, moral reasons there were. 
And as female reporters insisted on being more and more a part of it, they faced the dilemma of, do we bring report women reporters in the locker rooms? And they said, no, we don't let any fucking reporters in the locker rooms. These players need to get off the field, talk to themselves and their coaches and calm down and, and, and decompress for 15 minutes or so. And then we'll send them to the press room after they've had a shower and gotten dressed. And, and they, similarly, I, I heard uh, Vietnam vet uh, talking to me about the experience of returning home the way that they did following that war, which is literally you get on a plane and fucking Saigon and, and you're in Kansas tomorrow, you know, versus the second world war where when that war ended, Troops remained there for months after the cessation of hostilities, and they helped to rebuild the, the societies that they destroyed and then loaded up on slow-moving ships across the ocean. And in most cases, it was a year or more before the end of the war, before they had finally closed that chapter of their lives in the military. They'd had all that time to, to come to terms with the adjustment shit. We just expect too much now. You know, we, we expect you to be able to flip a switch. And I think this is not a sexist thing to say. I hope it's not a sexist thing to say, but for young men who are physically primed to be violent, feed off of uh, this concentrated high testosterone and all the other cultural attachments that go with it, to expect them to, to be on and turn it off instantaneously, that's unrealistic. Yeah. You know, they can't, it's just, I, I don't think anybody could. No, you can't. You, you can't. It, it's that's that's the thing, right? And, and I, I look, I look at it like we we have context is everything. I, I find it like, like context is is literally everything. The environments people are put into. I think I think today more than anything else, we are required to wear so many different hats, right? That I, yeah. I because of the nature, of the fact that we have a lot of places like the companies that used to separate and segregate these things went, nope, we're not doing that shit no more. You got to do it yeah. all. So it, it's very hard. It's very hard to find a balance that works for you and a balance that works for everybody else. And we're, I think, I think at some, I think at some point down the road, um, I think honestly, I think it, we're, we're, we're going down there. Everybody's going to be a freelancer for a little while, right. but I don't think it's somewhere down the road. They're going to resegregate some of this stuff. They're going to re put this stuff in a separate category because I think there's just a point where the adjustments are just too much. Asking like so many different things, being so many different things on so many different right. levels. Um, but then again, maybe 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 the on the flip side of that, um, we're gonna have to work more together because there's just the, the tasks are a lot more a lot more in, in um, intricate, complex, and you know just just. Yeah, I, I wonder about that even as creative sorts. Like, yeah. you know, look at what you do in your network of, of, of people. Because I mean, there's there there's the the most creative aspect of your work, you know, what you what you write and what you what you create for yourself. And then there's the and then there's the broadcast and all of its outflows. Um, that you're it, definitely, but it works because you have this extremely dense network of contacts and interesting creative source of people who you can bring in to, to, to accentuate and make it work. Right. I yeah. mean, couldn't work without you. So you're necessary, but not sufficient. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We, we all need each other in that regard. Yeah. No, that's it. Like I, like the, the, the show, the show, because just of who I am, the way it works is that it wouldn't work. Like, like as I was told from Joe, it's like your show's a quirky show, but it works because it's, it's essentially the creative. But if I didn't have guests, I mean, I could do a couple episodes where I could just make an ass of myself for like an hour. But after the, but what would be, sure. the, but what, 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 what would be the fucking point after that, right? Right, I need, right. I need, I need people to talk to, but also I need people that are willing to be talked. Like, like I, I this is an intricate show, more intricate than actually, just now that you've said that, than I, even I realized. Um, but, it, but we are creating more and more moving parts. I look at, say, a comic book industry. A comic book industry traditionally is, you usually have you have a team you have it anywhere from a team of two to five people making one book. I'm beginning to, I, and, I'm, and as I get older, I understand it because every part of it is so intricate. You almost we have we have become almost all of us have become Renaissance men and women. We've had no choice. Right. Yeah. That that's weird, isn't it? That that you know, in the in this uh, you know in the freelance age, you have to be something of a generalist. I mean, 
Yeah. Because you have to be able to do your own accounting and billing and receiving, and you have to be able to do your own composing, and you have to be able to do your own, in your case, producing. I mean, you have to have both technical and content expertise, and you have just a little bit of everything. Um, and it, you know, I, it sucks for me because there's things that I'm just absolutely not good at. You know, I mean, I'm I'm very good at the content of my work. I can't run my company worth a shit. I I don't have the business organization skills or talents to do that. Um, and I could do something about that. But I'd just rather not. That's <laughs> I don't fair. Like, I just don't that's want fair, to. Right. That's fair. I mean, I, it, mean, it, 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 I hope that it, I mean, well, of course, it, you know, it's, it's mine. Fuck it. I can run it into the ground if I want to. Right. I, yeah. I just, I, I don't want to. It's not, it's not fun. I, I don't care about balancing the books and, and <laughs> making sure the quarterly taxes are paid on time and everything. And I, you know, and I'm like, fuck it. If the president doesn't have to pay taxes, you know, I'll get around to mine later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I have a friend, she, uh, she told me, she writes stories about how her accountant just has a little meltdown because she's always late on her taxes. It's just like, he, he just looks at her and he's like, why? Why do you do this to me? <laughs> right? But uh, yeah, I, I can relate. I fail to check the bank balances so often that I was like, hey, why did I get that fee? Oh, fuck, I didn't put money in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, really, I, no, nobody's going to have any money for long. Before long, we're going to be bartering with, you know, oh, vaccines oh, oh, I, and, and I, water. I, I, I am really like that. Actually, in some ways, scares it, it scares me because where where we're headed is essentially. I'm actually writing my next size five now based on this on this little fear. In yeah. one sense, right now, our society is as fragile as a light bulb. You can turn it yeah. on and everything works. You turn it off, it's over. Like oh, there's, yeah, yeah. there's literally not, there's literally fucking nothing. And, yeah, it, we were part of the same conversation in, in Calgary, uh, uh, Josh, and somebody asked, to, you know, I think it was Asimov who said the essential difference between sci-fi and fantasy is that science fiction is possible and fantasy is not. And I would have said, eh, well, you know, is, is sci-fi really possible? Well, the, the dystopian post-apocalyptic goddamn sci-fi is sure possible because we're looking at the front edge of it right now. Mm -hmm. And some people can be expected to be well-adjusted, normal, post-apocalyptic survivors, and others will not be. I mean, they're going to be thugs and hooligans. And, uh, well, well and, yeah, because, again, wealth wealth is now... So my, my biggest nightmare about the lockdown event, if we do enough of these things, we're going to wake up one day, it's going to be the United States of Jeff Bezos. And the United sure. States, right, right. right because right. Am, Amazon, I mean, he's making so much money, I, I wonder if, I wonder just how much he's... He's got like his own money bin right now that he's jumping in just accounting because yeah if, if Forbes if if Forbes is right the 400 richest Americans are worth 3.2 trillion dollars which is 12 zeros um, and that's akin to the gross domestic product of some of the smaller nations in the world which you know 400 of the wealthiest Americans are more powerful than uh, say uh, Portugal, you know, I mean, do we have to give them a seat at the UN and shit? I mean, is, is going to have Zuckerberg and Bezos and, and Elon Musk and, 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 and Mark Cuban just kind of deciding the fate of the world, but, but, which I'm not, I'm not sure I wouldn't be okay with that. I mean, I kind of like them better than some of the lawmakers in my country. I don't know about yours, but yeah. You know. But they kind of do now. That's the thing. Of course they, they do. That, they, yeah. Cause, cause if they have that much money, they have that much sway. All the laws are being made are already laws they've approved. Right on some levels, it's it's one of those money talks, bullshit walks, right? Yeah. Or, or or as a, my favorite golden rule is, he who has the gold makes the rules. It has That's always right. been that way, and yeah. even before. And one I learned recently: he who is the exception is the king. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's, that, right. that's how you, that's how you can tell. That's how you can tell who's in charge. It's not. It's not the people that are playing along. It's the it, it's the ones who don't, and that's the right. They're the one that's what's telling you that they're in charge. It's I like, like the uh, in, in, in the uh, one of the early scenes of uh, Holy Grail and uh, uh, Monty Python's Holy Grail, and the, the, the <laughs> Graham Chapman is trotting up to the peasants in the field, and it says one says it must be a king. So how do you know he's a king? He said, Well, he's, he hadn't got shit all over him. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's the one without shit all over him. It's true. That that's literally that's literally the that's literally the um that's how you can tell. I mean that's yeah. right, right? 
that's literally how you can tell it's like it's so it's it's an obvious thing but people like it 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 amazes me how much in some ways people remember. And it also amazes me at the same time how much people forget, right? I've literally watched, I've literally have watched your, your, your history of the last 60 years replay out completely in this last year. All of oh, it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then there are micro cycles within cycles as well. So if, if you look, for instance, at, um, you know, our financial markets are not truly regulated to this day, not in the sense that Canadian markets are regulated or, or even most European markets are regulated. And so consequently, yeah, we'll have these big boom periods where a few people make 500% in a day and then the rest of everybody loses their ass once, about once every 20 years. And, you know, why does it happen once every 20 years? We have massive course correction. It, well, that's generational memory. That, that, that's how long it took for a new generation of people who didn't remember the last crash to now be successful professionals with some discretionary money to throw around. And they all think they're fucking Warren Buffett and you're not Warren Buffett, but there are people out there who will prey on you as investors, whether you know what you're doing or not. So Mon and Damon asked, do you have a, do you have a Wikipedia page, Tony? Do I have a Wiki page? No, yeah. I do not. Okay. He does not. My, yeah. So I have some that I like though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. There, there are, the, I mean, Tony Phillips is a pretty common name. I, I, I don't know. So what's the question? Well, because he, 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 there's a Wikipedia page. It's n.wikipedia.org slash wiki slash Tony Phillips. That's in the comments section right now. And he's, he's then Mona was asking if, if that's accurate. And, and when he said, no, then goes, what's that then? I was like, I don't know. I have absolutely no idea. Ask your, yeah. ask, 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 ask. Ask the viewer to click on it and tell me what it says. Yeah, what well, you want to click? Let us know, Mana. We'll we'll definitely. I mean, he he got his attention for sure. There there are things you know. That's interesting. There are things that exist out there that you don't know exist about you until you, you get looking because you know. I, the, I, I I found an I am my I found I had an IMDP hairs. Um. Ah. Uh, okay. So it basically uh, a baseball player that died in two thousand. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, the the uh, yeah that Tony Phillips he he died prematurely. He's only not, he's not even ten years older than me. Um, played following a, a journeyman career in the in the uh, majors for the 16, 18 seasons. He went on and continued to play uh, various minor league levels until he was like fifty, I think, or in his fifties. Um, passed away within the last several years, uh, tragically. Played with the uh, Oakland A's most notably. Um, and he's, Outstanding baseball player that people my age remember. There you go. Cool sports knowledge. A lot here on the podcast. Anyways. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, we'll do CFL. Hey, speaking of the CFL, so, you know, somebody told me that the average age of a CFL fan is like 70 now or something. Like I, believe, yeah, yeah, I, I believe. No, it did. It, it's it's a, um, so baseball's age. Oh, uh, not dead Tony from modern. He said like the Indian thing. He like, he liked the Indian thing or whatever that, is so um but anyway go go for like baseball has aged um football is the nfl hasn't aged I mean, no i know so th this was sad to me because yeah. uh, as you know when i'm in canada i i though you know i, I can't strip off the the uh, obnoxious americanness that's just inherent in me but i i do try to appreciate actively canadians and i you, you know i'm a i'm a fan of your society and i the, the tiny differences between us culturally are what make Canada very special to me. Mm -hmm. And I also have always been a fan of the CFL. Um, my dad played for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders I, back in 50, I 1953. Yeah, so you know, I, I've, I've loved uh, the CFL from, a dis from afar for a long time. I was in the uh, uh, terminal at the airport in uh, m m Vancouver. Yeah. I was waiting on Jackson to fly in from Calgary, and, and it was football season uh, a year or two ago. And the Grey Cup was on, but the NFL still had, you know, another month or so of football left to play. And so I was at a sports bar, and, and uh, I sat down, and I really wanted to watch the Grey Cup. And they had, like, ten television screens. One of them was about this big, and it had the Grey Cup. And then all the great, big, huge sports screens was broadcasting the NFL. And I, I, that's sad. It is. That's um, it. The CF, the CFL state was steel when the NFL bought it. Like pretty much, pretty much turned it into their farm league. Uh, I think it was like late nineties. 
yeah. because uh, once they did that, I mean, you knew the, the CFL's fate was was pretty much set in stone, unfortunately, because it, what it basically meant was um, it would never grow again. Like it would always, it would it would survive, but it yeah. would never hit its peaks again because the NFL, the NFL is is an interesting organization. Um, it owns America. It will never own the world. Soccer, soccer is a giant. Like right, like, right. But yeah. European football is it, it owns the rest of the world. Yeah. But in North America, football is king. And yeah. the NFL, the NFL. I I, I watch I watch sports debate shows sometimes just because they, they, they're good to write to because they speak mm-hmm. complete and other nonsense that I don't really have to worry about and think about very hard. But it's it's a good it's a nice it's a nice steady sounding thing and um right they put they push the nfl every single day and mm-hmm. i realized something to me i realized just how powerful the nfl really was when you have that much basically ad time on television every single day um fox fs1 probably like five hours a day espn you got yeah. to many hours there um once you realize that's like that is a big powerful organization like you know no one thinks of entertainment. no one thinks of entertainment as like powerful but then you look at some of these entertainment conglomerates and like right wow their reach is ridiculous that's what makes me think for the athletes you know fans get outraged and they they, they want to you know act like it's horrible that you know a, a player just signed a 50 million dollar contract I mean, he's only making 50 million dollars because the rich industry that's make that he plays for is making a lot more fucking money off him than that oh absolutely no, no he's no, making no. a fraction of what he's actually worth oh you know, right? no. because that's how big the industry is. no it, 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 no it is like like the sit there and think about it, like i i look at it going Football app. This is the difference. This is why I think athletes make more than artists. Ultimately, it's not just not just the emphasis on the brawn over the brain, right? Uh, right. But also just the simple fact that I think because they're team sports, I think because they're an or- that you can organize. Organizing artists is like playing marbles in a corner. Oh yeah, 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 right. yeah, yeah, right. It's like playing marbles in a corner. You, yeah. you might be able to do it for a very short period of time. Eventually, the marbles right. are going to go wherever the hell they want to go. Football. Team sports require a certain degree of discipline, collaboration, and play, right? Yep. To really to really be successful at them. So, I think because of the team structure and the team environment, it, I think it was actually more conducive to to push athletics for that reason, right? Yep. It looks visually more impressive, but also it it's it's a court. It's more you have to coordinate more naturally there. Artists we're problem solvers by our very nature, which means we yep. all have our own approaches that are different. We can work together, but once the project is no, done, no. you're like, <laughs> we, we try for briefly. We do, yeah. But yeah, no, yeah right. we can do it for a project. We can do it yeah. for a project. Could we do it? Could we do it for, for a our, career? No, no, yeah. no. Because no. because we're also prima donnas, and that that's the. You know, I, I think though, there's also this, Josh. That athletes are, in a sense, artists, entertainers. You know that. Oh, absolutely, no. That it, there's art. Can, but. You 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 can watch them perform, so they're more akin to an actor or a singer, right? Yes. You can't watch an author. I mean, no. that's like, that'd be like watching golf. I mean, you know what? Seriously, I watch. There are people. There are channels on here where people just pop bubbles. I mean, I, I we we live it. I mean, we. Hey, I, yeah, we we, we, we've got televised fishing. Yeah. You know? All right. I mean. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I don't, I don't really, I don't really know what this. Uh, something that's truly unwatchable, right? It either has, I think, it has to be so terrible that it's not, it's not even car crash fun anymore. It's like, oh god, this is like, who, like, a Star Wars Christmas special, like, yeah. it was an abortion <laughs> on television. It was literally an abortion. Whoever came up with that, right? I could see, I could see, I could see why for the longest time, for the longest time, the Star Wars cast denied ever doing it. I can't blame them. You watch that, you try watching that, it's like that hurt my soul because it's just like, is yeah, that, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, it's not just bad. Yeah. It's beyond the reason. It hurt my soul. Yeah, yeah no, I got, I, I, I am a fascinator right now by the fact that um, during a global calamity of this scale, with you know the. the deaths like the the 
black plague hanging around us and what have you. The thing that has really galvanized Western civilization is a baby fucking puppet. <laughs> this Mandalorian shit. Wow. So, and now, no, I'm not saying it's not good. Either. It is good. It's got uh, Apollo Creed's dad and 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 a, and a fucking puppet, you know. And and, and it's and um, that's what people need, you know. Because if you look at the uh, the movies of the 1930s, you know, the depths of the Great Depression, you know, they, they didn't, they, these weren't you know heavy drama, you know, bleak period pieces. They're all frolicking and levity and, and musicals and, and, and chorus line numbers and shit because that's what people needed. Yeah. And I think right now what we need is a little green baby and uh, and a dude in a mask. So, so, so what, what? So one of my next projects is I'm, my villain is a giant cupcake, Pac-Man stylist, giant cupcake because I can't, I just can't. And. Uh, <laughs> Right, 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 right. Because because I, I decided, like, I, my, my Cloud Diver series, my first novel came out this year, and it's a homage to video games. So I decided, like, for, for, for the second book, okay, I did, I did my little, some Final Fantasy, some, some Monster World, some, some cool stuff in the first one. Well, this one coming up is like, I, I, I'm freaking referencing Pac-Man, because Pac-Man's awesome. Who doesn't like Pac-Man, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I came up with this giant Frankenstein-style cupcake that's very reminiscent of something you see on the Disney afternoon once upon a time, right? And there's literally like there, there's literally going to be milk carton like images in there, like, and I'm actually going to put like people I know. I actually like here's the fun fun fact. Here's the fun fact about here's the fun fact about uh, being an author that there you can get everybody involved. Everybody's cool if you're murdering them in your story. Everybody's cool. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Everybody's Absolutely. cool with it. So. I go, who wants to die to a giant cuppy? Me, 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 me. So it's going to yeah. be like, have you, have you, so it's a red velvet cupcake that's actually very Pac-Man-esque, but nom, nom, nom. there's literally a scene, and this is like a, something I, I have, where my main character is a coward anyway. He literally ch gets chased into a maze, like, and the Pac-Man's actually following him. When he gets behind, the, 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 the cupcake cheats and starts eating the actual maze. You know, I, I haven't played with that uh, uh, enough. The fact that... you. Yeah, I mean your your inner uh, homicidal maniac can actually be played out as an author, right? I, I mean, that's a trope I need to explore because yeah, because like, I, mean, I mean I've got some really good friends. I'll straight up fucking murder. Them. You know, that, 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 see, yeah. here's the best part: there are people. See, the beautiful thing about being a writer is I can I can do anything I want to a character inside. Now, if I really want to punish somebody, I'll put them in a love scene. Right? Yeah, that's, that's how you punish somebody. Yeah. My favorite, my favorite, um, so Babylon Five, right, way back in the day. So Peter, like, uh, a guy played the Jakar and Mondo pulled a really nasty prank on J. Michael Straczynski. His revenge was to do a a, a complete fan fiction esque Jakar Mondo sex scene, right? Just on uh, nice. like it never aired. It was just it was just as a prank to them, as a thank you for what they they did to him, right? Oh, that's great. Yeah, he made a yeah. fan fiction, and, and, yeah. and so, like, 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 so, and that's my threat, and that's my threat to anybody. If, like, that ever really truly crosses me, I will make you fan fiction. I'm not even gonna make you fiction. I'm gonna make you fan fiction, right? Somewhere, somehow, some way, right? Yeah. And it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a romance scene because I'm that, and, and it's gonna be bad. I'm gonna make sure it's bad the whole yeah. way through, and you're gonna be. I'm I, I might just, you know, the, do a whole series of, of, of vignettes of people I know and the creative ways in, in which they get slaughtered. Hey, 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 <laughs> come up with like a homicidal maniac. It's just, just straight up butchering people on yeah, the page. Right? Like they, they have, they have, they, they like they, they have like they have um they have a show on YouTube called Ninja Sex Party. There's actually a ninja. He's just a stone cold killer. Just, mm -hmm. just have a stone cold killer type. You can just be filled with anger and angst and rage and all that other wonderful fun stuff you like, right? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you just, you, you, you know, you can find that part that you're like, okay, Josh, you're an obnoxious asshole. I'm gonna but, but you know, it. that anger and that rage shit and everything, that's only good, like, you know, for effect. It was like, you don't really want to actually take it out on the world. No, like, no, I no. It, like, I, I, read, I read Ted Kaczynski's manifesto, and I was like, man, this is a really, really bright dude with some, you know, pretty... 
eh, on, sur- on the surface, you know, fairly easy insights, but but key insights into post-industrial society and all that. Kaczynski's a really bright guy, but the bombing people shit, you don't really need to do that. I mean, Unabomber was not a nice fucking character. No, no, no. If you look, if you... I mean, I, I personally would not mail bomb a CEO. That, that's, I just draw the line there, right? Well, I don't know. No, 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 so, some I, of I your viewers I, probably are active mail bombers. I'm not. I don't do that. I, here, here's, what I, here's what I do think, though. I think it, at, as society gets poorer and we look forward to blame more people and see unfortunate reality, what terrifies, like legitimately what terrifies me going forward is it's not even guns anymore. Drones actually scared. Oh, me. sure, they, yeah, they yeah. We're being bad. serious. Yes, absolutely. It is a terrifying time to be alive. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. There, because, there is so much tribal anger, and so you know, and, and, and what, what there is, there's so much you know marginalization. People just push to to the belief that they're discounted and they're overlooked and they're uh, they're under attack. And you know something, Josh, you lived you lived in the heartland of my country. Yeah, yeah, and. I think you might get what I'm saying here, and I hope others do. Um, you know, we, we want to make it by, or at least the mainstream media wants to make it like uh, Biden's electoral college victory is this grand mandate of anti-Trumpism. And that's not right. I mean, no. the, the vote in this country, popular vote, was 81 million to 74 million. Now, in a basketball game, 81 to 74 is a pretty close buck contest. And the fact is, Donald Trump won 30 out of 50 states. He just didn't win the most populous ones. And, and, and if, we, if we continue to ignore and treat the people in the Midlands of this country between the Rockies and the Appalachians like they're fucking rubes, like they're hicks, like they don't matter, why would they not feel under attack by a coastal elitism? They fucking are. And they have a reason not to like that. And, and well, so, I, actually, actually, let, let me let me go one step further because you, you you actually aren't going far enough. I just uh, I've been having a, like a debate with somebody for politics for a few days, and they will refuse. They they don't acknowledge the fact. Okay, seventy four million people voted for Trump. In any other election, that would be a win. Any it's the other second election. most. It's the second largest number of votes ever cast for yeah, a presidential yeah. okay. candidate. So, second only to Joe Biden. Right? Right. And, and, and they refuse to acknowledge this fact. They think that, that 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 these people are racist or stupid. It's like no, some of them sure were racist. Some of them just followed on the crowd. But it's more than that. You have again, part of it was Biden is responsible. For, it played a big role in the way the prison system is constructed today. Right. Right. So ask a ask a young African American or a young person from Mexico, like Puerto Rican or Mexican descent. Oh, yeah, yeah. Trump's share of the black vote increased from twenty sixteen yeah, to twenty. Yeah, 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 because. <laughs> Yeah. Because because it was Biden. Because what's the choice there? The guy that's right. openly the guy that openly is trying to polarize you, or the guy that's made money off you, right? You know where where you're going with this, Josh? Too there was. I, I wish I could remember this journalist's name. It's a wonderful piece uh, uh, in the Atlantic, um, and it, the author made the point that uh, Trump's loss in November had more to do with anti-Trump vote than it did with pro-Biden vote. And yes. a person, a, a, an elected leader with exactly the same policies and positions and, and and exactly the same initiatives as Donald Trump, who was just a more skillful politician, would have won. Yeah. <laughs> it's that he can't, you know, it, it has to do with his personal failings. It does. It's not that an overwhelming majority of Americans but, but, don't also- agree in principle. But, but there's also one other thing that no one's talking about. This is the other thing that Democrats spent. 60 million people did not vote. Right. Right? Which right. means that which means that 80 million people at most connected with this co- government. 80 mi- and that's, as you say, an, anti-tru- uh, an anti-Trump thing. That means, this is what this means, and, I, and again, there is a serious problem with the government as it's constructed today, right? Yep. Uh, right, And its relationship to its people. Well, that's true. Uh, it, that, that and, and a huge it, problem. It, it, nowhere in America is it, uh, it, it no, nowhere other than America can you use the term democracy to mean something that's so not democratic. Because, yeah. you know, while the, the margin in the popular vote was 7 million votes, the truth is that four states in the upper Midwest 
swung to Joe Biden by a combined margin of 60,000 votes. That's it. 60,000 votes decided the outcome of an election, not 81 million votes. And, and it, it, you know, in effect, even if you say, well, 81 million people voted for Joe Biden, that's more than have ever voted for any president. Yes, it's 25 percent of Americans. Three out of four Americans did not vote for the man who will be the president of that's of the United that's States, it. and that's a fright, and that's a frightening fact. Like, it, right, all right. Mm-hmm. The number sounds impressive until you realize that okay, you minus a hundred million for children. Okay, right, right. That's who yeah. didn't vote. That's yeah. who didn't vote. Like Sixty million people did not vote, which yeah. tells you, which tells you that okay. And, and my theory is really simple. You've had the same kind of person in power for forty for sixty years. That's one of the reasons, right? That's the mm-hmm. problem. That's your problem. I don't know if you fix it in time. If you don't, see, I, I don't care. Like this election, maybe Biden is the right stop gap short term. I don't know. But we'll, 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 time will tell on that one. But in 2024, if I see two dittering old grandpas with similar views on similar, no, yeah, things, yeah, you guys are fucked. I, I think the I, I think the younger and more progressive voters who did hold their nose and vote for Joe Biden did so because they realize he's the strategically best choice at the moment. But they do not expect to see a fucking like eighty year old running in twenty twenty four. They expect to see real progress and real change. And I wish them all the best. I I think what will help is that you know old people die, and you know perhaps a younger vision creates a new expectation. Maybe, um, but I, I I don't know. Like that, like that's the thing that like worries me because if I see two, like, this is what, this is how I see it. If I see two old grandpas in twenty twenty four, in twenty twenty eight, you guys are going to be right back to where you are. Oh, in 2016. Yeah. Right yeah. back, you're going to exactly be where you're at. And next time, the guy coming in will be worse than Trump was. It's not going to be better. It's going to be worse. Sure. Right? Yeah, that's the concern. Exactly. It, you know, I, I in four years ago, um, uh, I, I I said that you know the worry that I have about Donald Trump is how much he can normalize the abnormal in the course of the four years that he's going to have. And, and look, it it is no longer for most people outrageous to think that the president of the United States will have Nuremberg style rallies and lie and throw race baiting rhetoric out there and and call the uh, the free press an enemy of the people. That mo- most Americans don't apparently think that that's unpresidential. Oh, that's in four years' time. But you know. but but the problem again, looking at looking at him, he's not he's not so different from George Bush. George Bush mm-hmm. is not so different from his dad. Obviously, his dad is not that different from Ronald Reagan. And it's like Reagan and Trump. If you really look at them, they mirror each other in a frightening ways. Well, except in so far as Donald Trump is not an artful politician and Ronald Reagan was. No, no, no. Ronald, <laughs> the, biggest difference, the biggest difference between the two of them, Reagan was a smart, light, pirate, like he was a diplomat. He understood, right, right, right. But I would also argue to you, one of the big differences too is reality television. Right? Oh, yeah, the world has changed. Now, you got to hand it to Donald Trump. As yeah. for a man his age to catch on to the power of earned media and social uh, uh, media is all, uh, you know, hey, man. <laughs> since 2015, the, there is, well, I'll just say, period. I don't care where you start. No human being in the history of the world has gotten more publicity than Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. Not the Beatles, not J- JFK, not Muhammad Ali, not Michael Jordan. I don't give a shit. You, nobody, all put together, they haven't gotten it. For five years, there has been a 24-hour news cycle on multiple channels in multiple countries that talk about nothing but Donald Trump. And if the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about, he wins. No, now, and, and, hate and the fucker all you want, but he, he's a, a man in his mid-70s. His who, who got it. His real power, which is why, right. up, which is why up, until, up until he lost, I haven't said a damn word about him because I understood what his game was. That's right. Right. Right, 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 right. I didn't say a damn word. Now I can say it because he's going out the door. But the the, the problem the problem is he's he's carried as you said the abnormal is normal. He's carried things farther along that tree that started with Nixon. Now, yeah. right? Maybe they take a step back. I hope so. But I, I think what I think is going to happen is before you guys progress, before you guys progress, and this is my unfortunate commentary about your country, you're going to have to fall. 
that's the only that i think that's the only way you're going to do it all right there's so, a lot of people who agree with you <laughs> yeah yeah that's that, that right that and i i hate saying it because i know what that actually is going to mean for you guys I, and honestly the majority of people there you have a lot of good people down there you really oh, i think so too you, I, you i'm very I, i'm very proud of my country but yeah, i think, yeah, I think but, americans are wonderful but, yeah. but I think you guys, I think, I think the ringer has just begun for you guys, unfortunately. And I want to send something on a happier note before we, I, we have to wrap up. Cause I have to unfortunately go. Yes, sir. Go. All right. Okay. Pleasant. I miss you, man. Oh, I miss you too, Josh. It's been, I mean, it, it time has flown in some regards, but in other ways, it just feels like it's been an eternity. I, I, you know, I hope you're doing well, and and I hope that Vancouver is treating you the way it should. I'm Vancouver. Actually, I'm, I'm in Ontario now because of COVID. Well, that the next time we chat, the next time we chat, I'll tell you about my crazy little ass. I will end up back in BC, I think, at some point down the road. But I think I'm going. I think I'm going to go east first in Ontario, because yeah. I, I, and then eventually I'm going to go back west. Because I, I, I so I, you I, have I, Americans who 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 enjoy your your program, and let me just tell them that you know from BC to Ontario is not like from San Francisco to Oakland. You're a long way away. Yeah, that's far. Yes, <laughs> from Detroit to LA. Think about that. Like that's literally okay. that's literally as far as I went in this last year. It was a crazy. I'd make it a very hard decision, but that's another story. I have to unfortunately go. But what we will do before we wrap up, I don't, do you have any? Did you have anything come out recently? If not, just promote what you did last time. It's no, awesome. I'd love to plug. I'd love to plug shit, um, uh, but I don't really need to. Um, however, uh, you can find. Uh, yeah, I have. I have a fiction book was out last year. It's called Prince of Piedra Plana. P i e d r a p l a n a. It's um uh. His, uh Historical coming of age, uh, 1930s West Texas. And I'm, I, I enjoy it. I'm proud of it. Also, um, early next year, uh, I'll be releasing a translation, an updated translation of uh, uh, Herman Hess, Siddhartha, one of my favorites of all time, and I think badly needed in this day and age. Uh, if you haven't read Siddhartha, hang on for a month and read mine. Um, I, I think the extent uh, translations have all needed updated, ba updating very badly, and I'm proud to have done it. So that's it for the plugs. But quite aside from that, I want to plug you, Josh, and thank you for having me on. You know, I told you in advance, I always enjoy these. I mean, every, every time we talk, it, it, it's, it's deeply enriching. And I'm, I'm just thrilled to see the new format uh, and see it working for you so well. And I know a lot of people are. Oh, thank you. And on that, uh, stay with me before when we wrap up. Talk to you real quick before we go. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to this episode or watching this episode. Just Josh and however you chose to do this. If you want to support the podcast, you can click on the subscribe button on my Twitch or on my YouTube channel. The link is in my is in the comments already. So feel free to say hello. I want to thank Tony. I want to thank you for listening. Stay inspired and keep shining in the darkness. Take care, guys.